Good evening and a special welcome to uh, our presenter this evening, uh, Professor Peter Knox, who is in out in Manila. It is 1 a.m. in Manila, and uh, he has generously agreed to do this webinar for us uh, well, instead of being in bed. So we welcome everybody else who has joined us this evening, especially those in South Africa who have de uh, deprived themselves uh, Pry and uh, all those wonderful things that uh, people are doing on Heritage Day here in South Africa. And uh, so without wasting any more time, uh, let me introduce to you Professor Peter Knox, who was born in Johannesburg in 1962, and uh, he's got two brothers, three sisters, and uh, all but two still in South Africa. He did his matric at De La Salle College in Johannesburg. Uh, and then uh, after which he went to UCT to study maths and chemistry and worked every summer in, in, in industrial chemistry and uh, apparently he hated it. <laughs> he has studied philosophy, theology and education in Birmingham, London, Maritzburg and Ottawa respectively, where he did his uh, PhD in systematic and historical theology on AIDS and ancestors and salvation. That was, I think that was his dissertation, his, uh, dissertation, a PhD dissertation or thesis. He has worked in parishes in Soweto, Bramfontein and Ottawa. He taught maths and science in England and Younger, Cape Town. He also taught theology at St. John Vianney, the National Sem Seminary in Pretoria and uh, St. Augustine College in Johannesburg. He has run the Archdiocesan School of Theology for about 65 men who are starting towards being uh, permanent uh, deacons. He spent uh, the last uh, 10 or so, almost 11 years now, in Nairobi, teaching theology and environmental ethics at the Jesuit School of Theology at Hakima College. <clears throat> he, has, uh, he was the dean of a uh, school and he was the Dean of a School and Faculty of Theology, as well as the Deputy Principal for Academic Affairs at the Hakima uh, College. Since June uh, last, he has worked as with Jesuit Institute in Johannesburg and spends a lot of time writing everything and, and, and nothing. That's what he says. Those are not my words. His passion for environmental theology began before the publication of Lorazzo C. And he spent over eight years, the last eight years, popularizing the message of the encyclical. <laughs> Professor Knox, you have the oh, floor. Man. Thank you again for your time and for agreeing Can to make notes? do this uh, uh, presentation in a very odd hour from Manila in the Philippines. Over to you, Betty. Thank you. Thanks very much, Father Rampit Lobo. And thank you to the um, Jesuit Institute in South Africa for permitting me to give this give this webinar, share this webinar, these thoughts with you from Manila, and to the Jesuit province in Southern Africa, the Social Justice Apostolate Desk has has kindly agreed to host this webinar uh, for this season of creation. Um, the season of creation, as you know, it runs for the whole of September. And up till the 4th of October, the Feast of St. Francis of Assisi, that's one of the new liturgical seasons which has been added, at least to the Roman Catholic Church by Pope Francis. But it has existed in the Anglican and in many um, Orthodox churches since the 1990s. So the Catholic Church is recently in church times, that is, which spans millennia. The Catholic Church has recently got into this season of creation, where we are particularly conscious of the gift of creation and the fact that God has created so much and so much has been created over millennia. I mean, well, in fact, more than millennia, millions of years uh, to support life and so much that is life on this planet of ours. The topic for this year's season of creation is to hope and act with creation. And I think hope is only a, a valid stance if we actually do something. You know, we can't just kind of hope 
as a random optimism or as an unfounded optimism. Hope is something based in reality. Firstly, based Christian hope is based in what God has done. and But I think secondly, in what we are doing. And so we base our hope or our hope should be founded on something concrete. And then acting with creation, we'll come to the acting part in a while. And it's with creation rather than against creation. And I think many of the things we do inadvertently don't help creation or aren't helping the topic of tonight's uh, webinar, biodiversity. So when we want to act with creation, we're trying to say we're trying to go along with a plan of sustaining creation, sustaining biodiversity. So with that introduction to the season of creation, let's ask ourselves first what biodiversity is. I'm very nervous this evening because Professor Mary Scholes has just introduced herself to me. She's a professor of, of uh, botany at the University of Edwardes-Rund, and so she knows much, much more about biodiversity and life yeah, and the diversity of life than I do. But I'm going to give you a lay person's definition, which I got from National Geographic, um, about what biodiversity is or biological diversity. Biological diversity refers to the enormous variety of interdependent living things on Earth. So it's the things that are alive, plants, animals, bacteria, viruses, Sometimes viruses are included there, human beings, etc. And everything that's alive depends on, on an environment which is not always alive. We regard perhaps soil or sand or earth or water as not alive, but they're permeated with other with living creatures. So biodiversity is a whole web of relationships of animate and inanimate or living and not living um, elements and organisms. Some, so the National Geographic estimates that there are about 8.7 million species of life, living species on our planet Earth. And they say that about one seventh of these living species, 1.2 million of living species have been identified and described by science or what scientists some species evolve to survive in particular niches. In fact, every species evolves to survive in its particular niche. And, and niches are fairly specific. And as we come to habitat destruction a little bit later, we'll see that as a species niche becomes less and less um, secure, the species itself living in that niche becomes less and less uh, capable to survive. And then we have What's a species, you might ask? A species is a type of organism which cannot interbreed with another organism. If we take human beings, for example, we cannot interbreed with bonobos or chimpanzees. If you take a, a lion and a tiger, they can produce offspring, but those offspring in turn are not fertile. So that, that's what helps us to see a lion and a tiger are two different species, that the offspring of a, of a pairing are themselves not sexually fertile. So different species cannot interbreed and create new um, generations of, of interbred species. Biological diversity can relate to specific ecosystems, and we'll have a look at one example in half a minute. Uh, diversity refi refers to um, ecosystems or to entire regions, and we'll look at some regions in a moment as well. We used to think in terms of trophic chains. We used to talk of the chain of life. You'd have grass and then insects and then uh, primary, con primary consumers and then secondary consumers, and we'd think that everything's a chain. But now when we think of biological diversity, we think of life forming a web. We speak of the web of life. And so just using this one example, savannas, which we think are fairly unsophisticated ecosystems, are in fact very complex. And savannas, I'm told, retain a lot of, they're very good at sequestering carbon. The roots of, of grasslands particularly hold a lot of carbon. Um, and so 
let's have a look at a typical African scene or African savanna scene. You've got the primary producer, so that's taking carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, taking uh, water from the ground or from, from the atmosphere as well, producing uh, vegetation. So we have here grass, we've got acacia trees, we've got baobab trees. These are what are known as the primary producers or the producers. Then there are creatures which consume the primary production. We've got here grasshoppers or locusts, we've got zebras, we've got wildebeest, we've got gazelles, we've got what else? Um, giraffes, we've got elephants. They're consuming. They're the herbivores, we might, we, we might call them. But they're eating not just grass, they're eating all sorts of plant products. And then they they eat variously. Many of them just have their specific kind of diet. For example, wildebeest will eat grass. They are not browsers. They're not browsing on leaves normally. They eat grasses. And then we've got those animals which are preyed upon by the secondary consumers. So we've got in the picture, we've got a we've got a we've got cheetah here, we've got some lions over there, we've got secretary birds which will eat snakes and insects. Uh, we've got harrier eagles, which will eat smaller birds, which will which will pick small um, mammals. So the secondary consumers um, don't just have one specific prey. They're not as specific as the as the primary consumers. They'll take whatever prey they're able to cope with. So and so there again, you see. It's not just a straight line, but your secondary consumers will eat a whole lot of different different uh, primary consumers as they can. And then we've got the uh, de decomposers or the detritivores. South Africans love their tok-toki, their, um, our dung beetles. In fact, we've exported our dung beetles to the continent of Australia to help them to cope with their with too much animal uh, waste on the on the landscape, dung beetles will frequently bury uh, detritus animal waste uh, below the grounds. They lay their eggs there. The eggs have a when they hatch, they have a space. They have some food to consume. Uh, we've got dung beetles. We've got bacteria. So in the bottom left of this picture, we've got bacteria and viruses uh, and fungi, which help to break down. Um, dead matter or dead animals or dead plants, decompose them and put nutri nutrients back into the soil. And then, and then those nutrients are then cycled again. So rather than thinking of a single chain, we think of life as a web, all sorts of, all sorts of uh, relationships on that web. It's not just from bottom to top, but there are all sorts of relationships on a web. And if you lose one of the one of the big drops, say if you lose one species in the web of life, that has impacts and it has it has consequences for all the other for all the other species, all the other animals and plants around it. We can't simply remove um, the secondary consumers from a web of life. For example, remove all the lions, then there will be a very very simple example. Then there will be an explosion of herbivores. If the if the secondary consumers are not there, there'll be an explosion of the primary consumers. And very soon, if there are no no um, if there are no uh, carnivores in a in a landscape, these the herbivores, the primary consumers, may multiply too much, and then they might kill they might kill all of the plant matter or they may eat too much of the plant matter and deserts arise. Um, that's a very, very simple layperson sketch of bio biological diversity. And humans, Pope Francis reminds us again and again in his writing, are part of an ecosystem. Here I have a picture of the Sud, which is a, the largest wetland in Africa, in South Sudan. And humans are living in these little these little brown patches or human settlements or places where human beings have settled or have have lived, moved on, and they're within the entire wetland. We think of ourselves as many of us are city dwellers, 
but we're actually part of an environment. We're part of an ecosystem. We've got trees, we've got birds, we've got bees, we hope we've got animals, we've got pollinators, we've got all sorts of animals around us and plants around us, which are living organisms, and we can have a very negative effect or we can have a very positive effect. We can enhance the biological diversity around us, or we can just make a nice green lawn, which is in our gardens, if we have a back garden, and that really is not a very biodiverse environment. We have to think of ourselves as dependent on a whole load of other species which keep us alive, which support us, which allow us to stay alive. And so we have to think of ourselves as part of nature rather than removed from or separate from or somehow dominant over nature and determining what lives and what doesn't live. So we're part of nature and we're part of the, the whole biosphere that we belong to. This statement from Audrey Azoulay, who's the head of UNESCO or has been the head of UNESCO at, in 2020, she said, so UNESCO's United Nations Education and Science and Cultural Organization. So she's trying to relate human culture to education. She said, or oh, the UNESCO is trying to do that. Without biodiversity, there would be no life, no beauty in this planet. Biodiversity is the living tissue of the earth, and the health and the earth's health is intimately linked to human health. We are part of that living tissue. So it's not just Pope Francis, a nice holy man, talking about this in, a, in his nice kind of rarefied, or rarefied world. Here's Audrey. Azule, the head of UNESCO, saying that we are part of the living tissue of life on the planet. And there are lots of hotspots of biodiversity. Um, UNESCO, or the United Nations Environment Programme, has identified 36 biogeographic regions of exceptional value, regions on the planet, which are of enormous value to the diversity of life. And they provide irreplaceable ecological services. They provide so much um, carbon um, oxygen, for example, or they purify water, or they kind of give so much space for other animals to live. That's what's known as an ecological serv service. They sort of help the whole ecology to survive. Um, these biodiverse regions or bi bi not biodiverse hotspots contain a high level of endemic species, species which occur only in a very, very limited space and significant numbers of endangered species survive within these hotspots. These so-called hotspots, they cover about 1 40th, 2.5% of the surface of the Earth, and yet they're home to 2 billion people and more than 50% of endemic species, species that occur only in that particular space. If we think of, of the um, Cape Fynbos region, for example, a very, very unique floristic region. There's 6,000 species of plants which live just there in that little part of the Western Cape, which we call the Feinbos region. 6,000 species of plants. And then obviously there are species of bird, for example, or insects, which depend on those plants. And so the plants and the birds and the, the insects form a, a very special little kingdom and that's known as one of the biodiverse hotspots in Africa. More than two thirds of the species in these hotspots have a high risk of being extinct, made extinct, um, because if you just take out one or two plants from a region, then a whole, a whole um, biodiverse region may collapse because there are one or two little elements in a web which fall apart and then the whole web can start becoming um, degenerate, degenerate. Tropical forests, for example, are known as the lungs of the earth. We have all of these trees pumping out oxygen all day long, absorbing carbon dioxide. They're helping the earth to breathe. Um, a lot more oxygen is produced by, by plankton in the ocean. And so the phytoplankton, the, the plant plankton in the ocean, is releasing oxygen all day long. So long as it's photosynthesizing, uh, they're producing the oxygen that we require to, to survive. Madagascar, the continent, so the subcontinent really off the east of Africa, 
this large island off the east of Africa. They call it the La Grande Ile, the big island. It has unique plants and animals which are found nowhere else on the world because Madagascar has drifted away from, if you follow the theory of continental drift, has drifted away from continental Africa. We can see how it fits into the side of Africa. If we're good at doing jigsaw puzzles, we can see how Madagascar used to fit into kind of the little bump in Mozambique, the coastline of Mozambique and Tanzania. Madagascar has been separate for billions of years, and so the animals and plants on that island have evolved over millions of years to be quite different to those on the mainland of the continent. Um, many important birding areas are known as biodiverse hotspots. They're in wetlands, that is common term swamps, uh, areas where there's there's lots of water, standing water, and wetlands support thousands and thousands, millions of different birds of a whole variety of species, and they're very important on, on avian migrations, the migrations of birds, and for birds to settle and breed in wetlands. Our savannas are under multiple threats in Africa, and also we'll look at mangrove swamps. They protect the coastline. So this is an ecological service. They protect the coastline from, from um, very high waves or very uh, from the rising sea level. They sort of give breeding grounds for fish and they also, they also help the coastline to remain in, intact. Um, here are some of the 36 biodiverse hotspots around the world. These things are in various dark colors. This is, um, and you'll notice that eight of these hotspots are in continental Africa. We're very aware of the Cape Floristic region, what we call the Fainbos region, but many of us are less aware of the succulent Karoo, which runs up our South African west coast into Namibia. Many of us are unaware that the Maputo Maputo land and Pondo land, Albany um, region along our east coast also has a great concentration of species and there it's known as another biodiverse hotspot. And then we carry on all the way up the east coast of Africa. Um, there's another biodiverse hotspot and the UNESCO is providing funding or has been providing funding and may provide funding for African countries, in this case, Mozambique, Kenya, Tanz Kenya, Tanzania, and Somalia to continue to support the, that coastal um, vegetation and therefore the wildlife there. Madagascar, as I have already mentioned, is another biodiverse hotspot with the Indian Ocean Islands. Uh, the African Afromontane region in the east of Africa that is running down the Great Rift Valley. Um, and and the Great Lakes region that supports life, which is very very um, very unique and very important. The Horn of Africa, we think of that as a place where there's constant conflict, and there's frequent conflict in the Horn of Africa. But it's another biodiverse region. The forests along the Bight of Africa, um, the Guinea forests of West Africa, is really important. And then up along the Me Mediterranean coast, we've got another on the Mediterranean basin, we've got another area of real important concentration of, of um, life, plant and animal life. So Africa is really important in terms of the biodiversity. We have great wide open plains and we have concentrations of large mammals which really don't exist anymore on most of the other continents. So we've got all this wide open space where the megafauna, the large animals, can continue to, to thrive. Why is there concern about biodiversity? Why is the United Nations, why is Pope Francis writing about biodiversity? Why do people worried about biodiversity? It's basically because human activity is slowly changing the planet, modifying the planet. Um, the first, the other big threat to the planet that we're all aware of is climate change. And, you know, as the climate is changing, plants and animal species can no longer survive in the niche 
which they've lived in for generations, thousands, possibly tens and hundreds of thousands of years, because the climate is changing there and they're not able to, it's either too wet or too dry or too hot or too cold. And so animals and plants have to move to, if plants can't move that easily, animals have to move to spaces where they can survive more easily. The oceans are becoming more and more acid due to pollution, which is going into the atmosphere, and acid rain is acid rain is falling and making the ocean more acidic. That is dissolving some of the corals, which are the seed beds or the nurseries for many fish species, many ocean species. And so the corals are no longer supporting the life which they used to support because the corals are being um, corroded by the ocean acidification. People are taking and taking and taking resources. I read recently an article about mining in the Western Cape, and that mining is spilling over into the Richtersfeld Nature Reserve. And so the, it seems that the government of our country, South Africa, is not that concerned about, um, about preserving the Richtersfeld. It just looks like an empty desert or a very fairly barren place. And so as people are extracting more and more resources, mines make an enormous damage to the area immediately surrounding the area, the mine, and also to the water, both below the surface and on the surface around the mine. Deserts are spreading, forests are being chopped down uh, for all sorts of reasons. People are taking more and more forest space for agriculture. Landscapes are changing. And as cities grow, as populations grow, cities have to spread out. And so they spread into the area that's easiest to, to spread into, that is flat, possibly wetlands or, or savannas and things like that. Generally, people don't like to build cities on mountainsides. It's too complicated, although Johannesburg is built on a whole series of mountains. And so people would rather spread out into flatter areas. And then agriculture is spreading as well. Millions and millions of hectares over the last decades has been taken over by agriculture. So many habitats of animals and plants have been lost, and the species of those habitats are losing their niche. The species can no longer survive. Other species are being overexploited. If we think of hunting, for example, we're going to see, I imagine, in our generation, the last southern white rhinos. Well, I don't imagine. Certainly the northern white rhinos have been hunted to extinction. Um, some plant species, which people use for traditional medicines, are being overexploited. And it's not, there's not a sustainable use of um, medi medical species for traditional medicines. Um, and since all species are interdependent, if one species is lost or several species are lost, that undermines the survival of the other species in the ecosystem, in the region, or in fact, in the planet. And many humans de depend on biodiversity, depend on natural life, nature, for their livelihood. Here's an example of Africa, only Africa, how people depend on or how economies depend on natural resources for, 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 for the economies to continue. In Africa, we see we about we see or southern Africa, our part of Africa, our little region here, 1.2 billion dollars per year is added to southern African economies just from fisheries. Now, we think, okay, that, that does obviously refer only to countries which have a coastline. There are some fisheries in Zambia, uh, Zimbabwe, depending on Lake Kariba and things like that. But $1.2 billion come into the Southern African economy from fish and the exploitation of fish. Recreation, um, we think of tourism, ecotourism, $11,000 per square kilometer per year coming into our Southern African um, economies all the way through to Angola and just south of the DRC. Um, fisheries have added value. And so if we look around, if we look around the continent, we see many, many people are dependent on the environment for their, for their economic survival. And yet, since 2001, 
the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, is asking whether we're in the sixth great extinction. So there have been five great extinctions as climate change, climates have changed around the, around the world. We've had ice ages, we've had repeated ice ages. Um, and as the temperature has got colder, animals have not been able to survive. But now this great extinction is taking place largely because of the activities of human beings. Human beings are responsible for the change in climate. Human beings are responsible for hunting animals beyond their survival rate to extinction. Human beings are um, changing landscapes and eroding landscapes and moving more and more into landscapes which animals require. This infographic and the next one come from 2001. So the International Union for the Conservation of Nature has done a census of different um, mammal, bird, amphibian, reptile, um, um, insects, uh, life, plants, um, fungi, and things like that. And they said, so they represented the representing it in this graphic, these species which are red are showing you the proportion of species which are being threatened by extinction or certainly um, the possibility that they won't be around for much longer. So amphibians are known as the kind of the canary in the cage. Amphibians give an indication of how healthy an ecosystem is. And when 41% of amphibians are threatened, amphibian species are threatened, then we know there's something very, very wrong with our, with our planet, with the life supporting ability of our planet. Maybe the wetlands are drying up or maybe um, too many poisons are getting into the wetlands where the amphibians live. Uh, we'll see, well, we won't see in this little lecture, but we'll see that there are great threats to amphibian life. And then the IUCN in their survey have done a, a summary, as far as they can tell, as far as we know, of species which have already died. 79 mammal species, 136 bird species, some non-flowering plants, some flowering plants dying off as their habitats are, are changing or as they're overexploited. Um, the World Economic Forum, so that nice, very, very secular, nothing wishy-washy, nothing fuzzy about the World Economic Forum. These are hard-nosed economists. They are saying uh, in their meeting this year that, um, that the loss of biodiversity and ecosystem collapse is a major threat. Within the next 10 years, this is going to be the third largest threat the world, that means human beings really, human beings will face before the year 2035. Half of the world's GDP is highly or moderately dependent on nature. I've shown you in Africa how we're dependent on, on nature and natural sourced uh, products. Over a million species, according to the World Economic Forum, it are, are at risk of dis extinction in the coming decades. And the World Economic Forum is not going to sort of collapse into uh, despair. They said that we human beings have the power to change this. We have the power to reverse the effect, the negative effect we are having on the environment. Humans urgently need to rethink our relationship with nature in order to halt and to reverse the alarming degradation of the natural world. Business leaders have a crucial role to play by putting nature at the core of their processes and decision making. So we think business, business leaders are just all about profit, but business leaders have to think of sustainable profit making. And that really involves having nature at the core of our decision making. In the, um, in the reports from the United Nations Environmental Program, their reports on biodiversity. There are these targets which were agreed by the United Nations uh, framework, framework for biodiversity, Convention on Biodiversity in a place called Aichi, Japan, I believe. In 2016, they said, we really have to preserve, and we all agree with that, biodiversity has to be preserved. But what's the state of biodiversity in Africa? The most recent 
The most recent statement I've got is from the United Nations Environment Program in 2016, which says biodiversity in Africa is continuing to decline. There's an ongoing loss of species and habitats. Africa contain, contains remarkable biodiversity, which I've mentioned already, including the most intact spaces and collections of large mammals on Earth. However, species abundance is in decline and threats to species are increasing. In the year 2014, that's now a decade ago, um, 6,419 animal species and 3,148 plant species were recorded as threatened on the red list of extinction, threatened with extinction on the red list of the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. So here are some of the threats that um, biodiversity is experiencing in Africa. And these black spots on, the, on this map from White and Case uh, 2018, these black spots are indicating where the threat is greatest. And so we see here in the Mediterranean region, we see here the Cape Floristic region, we see the succulent Karoo, we see up here along our eastern coast, we see threats here in Madagascar, along the east coast in, in Kenya and Tanzania, moving up into Somalia. So where there are some hot spots, there are also threats to, to biodiversity. Conflict, human, conflict between human beings, the need for constant growth. We've got this economic model which says economies have to grow, grow, grow. I interrogate that. I'm really not convinced economies have to grow to support growing populations. Um, but as economies grow, then the, the wild spaces are not growing. In fact, they're they're the problems of, prob of population growth and people taking animals, people taking plants, and those are, those are four threats to um, biodiversity. Then there are climate-related threats as well. Um, as agriculture is, is threatened because of changing climate, uh, agriculturalists, farmers have to spread out and they, they go and they colonize other areas for growing crops and for, for keeping their animals, their livestock. Migration is the movement of populations of people. They, they move into areas which were previously natural areas. Deforestation, loss, loss of carbon sinks, and water is being used more and more and more. We think of South Africa. Southern Africa is a very arid space. South Africa, Namibia, Botswana, um, particularly arid spaces. And we see that the, the forests in the Congo River Basin are being eroded as well. Forests are being chopped down. People are moving into forest areas. So since 2001, about 30%, in fact, more than 30% of the forest cover of our continent has been lost. And so what we have remaining now are these patches of forests. Okay, so what used to be this entire pink area has now been reduced to the brown area. And we have a very common species as dead as a dodo. So here are some species of animal in Africa which have become extinct. I've mentioned already the northern, northern white rhino. We hope that our southern white rhinos are not going to follow the same trajectory because of their, because of their horns. They're being hunted because of their horns. Um, the dodo, we have that expression, was killed in Mauritius simply because it was overhunted. Similarly with the quacha, our own kind of Southern African, Western Cape, it looks like a, it looks like a, a hybrid between a horse and a, don a donkey and a zebra. But in fact, it's a complete separate species. We've lost the Bulal, Bubal hartebeest up in, in Ethiopia, and we've lost this parent, this species of barbel again in the north of Africa, in the Atlas Mountains. So biodiversity loss is happening in Africa. These species and their contribution to their environment are no longer there. And that's a problem for the rest of the environment. Um, a plantation. So from one of the previous one of the previous Lenten lectures, I've had an interaction with Marilyn Aitken, who lives down in KwaZulu Natal, and she's put me on a line of 
research inquiry about the difference between plantations and forests. And um, plantations are not forests. Plantations are green deserts. If we just look at this image here, a plantation is a very, very You've got you've got plants, the trees which have been planted, in this case gum trees or eucalypts, and you've got some very, very limited um, vegetation on the ground. You may have one or two species of bird that can survive in a plantation, but you don't hear bird song as you do in natural forests. You don't have many, many wild mammals or animals in general living in a forest. Plantations are um, very, very water intense. They take disproportionate amounts of water. They, in South Africa, from plantations, most of our wood is exported. They're owned by corporations. They're not um, employment intensive. Plantations don't create a lot of jobs for, the, for people living in the area. And the paper mills so we've got paper mills next to our plantations. They pump a lot of chlorine into the water, into, into local water bodies. And their canopies generally prevent sunlight from entering and from other plant, and they prevent other plants from growing beneath plantations. There are some biodiversity threats or issues for concern in Africa. I've already mentioned habitat loss. Sometimes habitats are broken up and they're fragmented. So animals that depend on a particular habitat, for example, forest or savanna, they have to move from one part of their habitat to another part of the habitat. And very often they cross through human populations and they come into conflict with humans. And it's frequently the animals that lose out. Um, People overexploit traditional foods, traditional medicines, traditional decor. If you think of the the, the zebra skin you've got on your you've got on your uh, floor, if you think of the nice and goony carp, um, hide you've got there, some people want to decorate their walls with leopard skins or lion skins, and so they're adding natural decor, dead natural decor, to their homes. Climate change, I've mentioned, human populations are expanding, agricultural land is expanding. We're not a very, in Africa, we don't use very many agrochemicals, but where we do use agro agrochemicals, they they run into water street water courses and they make the water um too fertile, and so that only one or two species can can survive there, and then the other species get get crowded out by water hyacinth, for example, or algal blooms. Um, diseases spread. A friend of mine looks after birds and she's she's a vet for birds. She used to work for the for the um Gauteng government. Now she's a freelance bird veterinarian and she's seen avian influenza spreading to various flocks of birds all over the continent. She works all over the continent. We have commercial hunters chasing elephants and lions and rhinos and pangolins, and those are threatening the activities of the commercial hunters, threaten populations. Although there's an argument, I'm not convinced by it, that says that commercial hunting helps to sustain populations. I'm, I'm that argument is not resolved yet. Populations collapse. For example, we see African penguins, off our southern coast, the southern African coast, their their populations are just dropping because they're competing with commercial fisheries. Commercial fisheries are fishing too close to the pop to the breeding sites of African penguins, and so the commercial fisheries are losing out. The penguins have to swim further and further to go to their to to find food, and that's just weakening them. They have to spend further. They have to spend more time away from their nests and they're being weakened. And then exotic pets, we think of the popularity of African gray parrots. Those are important seed dispersers and their problems. The traditional muti or traditional medicine um, industry is taking away, um, sometimes over exploiting uh, our various, various plants and animal species. These are the various in addition to plant species, these are the various animal products we might find in traditional medicine shops, 
chemists. Okay, insects, tortoise shells, skins of elephants and pythons, shells, starfish, corals, porcupine, crocodiles, pangolins, vulture, oh, chameleons. This is from a from a Malagasy traditional medicine shop. Vultures, vultures give you insight. Vultures help you to see. Vultures help you to understand what's going on. Vultures have brains. They have intelligence. They bring good fortune, and all sorts of plant. This is from Kotunu in in Benin, um, a traditional medicine shop in Benin. You can see the harvesting of these plant products, and sometimes over harvesting. We have medicinal plants in South Africa. Many of them are not considered under any threat at all. This is from 2018. Many of them are not under threat at all. Some of them are threatened because a particular species of aloe, for example, or a chufbol, or particular plants will occur only in one particular region. And as you have more and more traditional doctors going to spaces to, to harvest uh, their particular plant species, uh, Eventually, the use is unsustainable, and so um, and so they become threatened. Some species, 0.1% of the species, have become extinct in the wild. Um, migration, animals come into conflict with humans when they have to migrate because their habitats are lost. Um, there are special spaces for migration. We think of the vast migrations in, in Africa, these bats, for example, are in Zambia. The flamingos taken pictures taken in South Africa, but they're also down the the Great Lakes in Eastern Africa. Here's the the um, the famous um, Kilimanjaro Mountain. So again, in East Africa, migrations of elephants, wildebeest, zebras, and these vast migrations take place in in our continent. And as the habitat is broken up, very often people start coming into conflict with animals. I know it's almost over time. We started a little bit late, so I hope you'll give me a couple of minutes extra to finish this presentation. So there are many, many threats to migratory species, and there is a convention specifically dealing with migratory species, and, and governments commit themselves to take care or to make land available for migratory species. Uh, Transfrontier areas or transfrontier parks are very important for animals to be able to move between national boundaries, to cross national boundaries. They don't need a passport. They don't need a visa. They've had generations of movement backwards and forwards before the border between Botswana and South Africa or South Africa and Zimbabwe was ever set up. Animals have been moving over these areas, and sometimes human populations have been following animal populations as well. And so trans transfrontier conservation areas are really important for, this, for the maintenance of biodiversity. What can, what does the church say? Um, I'm going to give us three quotes from Laudato Si, and then I'm going to stop there. We can talk about this all night, but I'm just going to end with three quotes from Pope Francis's encyclical on care for our common home. Right at the beginning of his encyclical in paragraph eight, Pope Francis is quoting Patriarch Bartholomew, the Patriarch of the Eastern Orthodox Churches. Bartholomew said uh, in 1977, so this is almost 50 years ago, for human beings to destroy biological diversity of God's creation, for human beings to degrade the integrity of the earth by causing changes in the earth's climate, by stripping the earth of its natural forests or by destroying wetlands, for human beings to contaminate the water of the earth, the land, the air, the life, Bartholomew makes a very strong judgment. This is sinful. These are sins. Because to commit a crime against the natural world is a sin against ourselves, because we are making life more difficult for future generations, and it's a sin against God. So Pope Bartholomew is very, very clear. He's unambiguous that harming nature is a sin. Pope Francis in Laudato Si, he's got 11 paragraphs on biodiversity and the loss of biodiversity, sometimes the collapse of biodiversity. He says, and I'm, he's really echoing what I'm saying, or I'm echoing what he has said in, 
loud out of sneak. The Earth's resources are being plundered because of short-sighted approaches to the economy, to economy, to commerce, and to production. The loss of forests and woodlands entails the loss of species, which may constitute extremely important resources in the future, not only for food, but also for curing diseases and other uses. Different species contain genes which could be key resources in years to come for meeting human needs and regulating environmental problems. But he says also that we don't have to think only in terms of what species are helpful for human beings, what species are going to support us, provide medicines or food for us. It's not about human beings. We don't put people at the center. He tells us not to be anthropocentric. Plants and animals have a right to exist in their own right. It's not, it's not helpful to think of species simply as resources to be exploited while overlooking the fact that they have value in themselves. Everything has an intrinsic right, he uses that term. Each year sees the disappearance of thousands of different plant and animal species, which we'll never know, which our children will never see because they've been lost forever. Think of the dodo. I would love to have seen a dodo. In fact, I've never been to Mauritius, um, but I would love to see the northern white rhino. I've been in Kenya for 10 years. I never saw one. The great majority of these animals and plants become extinct because of reasons related to human activities. Because of us, thousands of species will no longer give glory to God by their very existence, nor will they convey their message to us. Pope Francis again says we have no right. It's immoral for us to take plants and animals to the point of extinction. We could carry on talking for hours. I think I'll stop there and hand over again to Father Rampe Shobo. Thank you and so I much, Dr. Knox. Uh, <laughs> without okay. wasting any time, uh, Mary Scholes has asked to make a comment. Okay. After which we will tackle the three questions that are there. Mary Scholes, over to you, please. And uh, Please keep it uh, short and sweet. Thank you. So, oh, thank you very much. You know, professors at universities can't keep anything short and sweet. That's a trouble. So, like, uh, <laughs> but I just do want to make a few comments. You know, plantation forestry in South Africa always gets bad press. And I would just like to say you need to consider that against the trade-offs. And having plantation forestry always requires that whoever owns that plantation, be it a corporation, an industry or not, it needs to retain a certain boundary around that area, which is often larger than the plantation itself for the inherent biodiversity of that area. And, and people forget about that. So those species that are in that area are conserved much more rigorously than they would have been. The second thing is that uh, in the South African, you know, bioeconomy, plantations actually bring in more foreign income into South Africa than does mining. And mm. you can do the sums and mm. you can ask then what is the trade off between the, uh, the kind of rehabilitation costs of mining land versus the rehabilitation costs of plantation land. And so I have a lot of experience in that, but the monetary input from plantations far exceeds the water loss. And if those plantations were not there, you would probably have sugarcane, which has a much higher, especially in the low-lying areas, a much higher water usage than um, the forestries do. So I just want to uh, finish with uh, two last points. One is that uh, biodiversity is not only about species, as you've mostly focused on tonight, but it's also about the function, which you've also focused on, but it's the functional diversity of what those species bring to the ecosystem services, and then about the structure of those species in the system. So those are three very different, you know, definitions of biodiversity. And then finally, it's not an issue of population growth. It's an issue of consumption of the population that mm -hmm. is growing. So you need to put the population debate to bed quite quickly. 
So thank you very much, Peter. Not to be uh, disparaging, I should probably be calling you Father Knox, but uh, I've known you for a while and I really enjoyed your lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mary Scholes. Thank you, Mary. Uh, I appreciate that. Talking about po population growth, there's a question there on the chat box about population growth from Nani's uh, galaxy. With population growth, how do we expand human habitation without disturbing our ecosystem? That would be the first question. And then, uh, then we go to Debbie French and Terence. What do you think of Zimbabwe's recent decision to cull elephants to feed humans in the time of drought and uh, food scarcity? And lastly, from uh, Tony Rowland, not really biodiversity, but to reduce our carbon footprint. We are encouraged to change travel modes, e.g. flying. Isn't tourism, uh, tourism harmful as it is producing too much CO2? Where, where is the balance? So those three questions in that day, you can handle them. Thank you very much. Three very interesting questions. Um, yeah, I... I I feel guilty every time I get onto a plane, but I should feel equally guilty when I get into a motor car or onto a, onto a motorbike or anything that's using fossil fuels and putting carbon dioxide um, into the atmosphere. And I don't think it's a neurotic guilt. I think it's a fairly informed guilt. Um, obviously, planes and traveling in the air uh, requires a lot more or produces a lot more greenhouse gases, uh, carbon dioxide, than uh, if you were to walk the same distance, which is impossible, or take a train. Many Europeans are moving, people living in Europe, are moving from flights to trains, and they feel that trains, they believe that trains are less harmful for the environment. Tourism, uh, Mary has mentioned that tourism brings uh, revenue to the country. Um, yes, I mean, tourism, there are ways to, to be a tourist much closer to home. And I wonder how many of us really know, those of us who live in South Africa, so let's talk about any country, how many of us have done a lot of tourism in our own backyards? How many of us feel we want to travel to Europe, whereas we've got very, very beautiful um, places in Africa which we have never explored? Or I'm living in Asia at the moment. Many Asians aspire to go across the Pacific to the United to the United States and want to do tourism there. But I think we should be tourists in our own backyard first. Um, the question about Zimbabwe's decision to call elephants. Um, Zimbabwe is not alone. Namibia has been doing has done that as well very recently. There's a very severe drought going on in in the northern part of southern Africa, and they're looking to animals. So people want animal protein. People require animal protein. Where are the largest animals? Where are the largest concentrations of animals? People don't want to kill their herds of cattle or sheep. I mean, many of them are goats. Many of them are dying already. They don't want to further exploit their livestock. And so they look around for other sources of animal protein. It's possibly some of these in Namibia and in Zimbabwe, the, they've reached their carrying capacity of elephants. And so maybe they feel that, so they've done the maths, they've done the calculations calculations there, and they feel that protein from elephants will be um, their best source. On population growth, human, oh, so this question to Nani's galaxy, um, or Nani's universe really, um, population growth, how do we expand human habitation without disturbing our ecosystem? People say that cities are a very, very efficient way of keeping human populations in a certain space without the urban sprawl, without the urban spread. And if we build up rather than build out, that's a helpful way or it's a useful way. Uh, and if you have all of the necessary uh, infrastructure within an urban space, rather than populations going out further out. But as Mary Scholes has already said, it's not about population growth per se, it's about using too much or human consumption 
For example, one third of the food that's produced around the world is wasted between, between the time it's produced and the time it's disposed of, one third of the food is not being used. We should improve our food systems. We should store food better. We should harvest food better. We shouldn't lose food along the way. Uh, we shouldn't buy more than we need. I know if you're a single person household, it's difficult to buy um, just one orange. You don't go to pick and pay and say, I'll have one orange, please. Um, because that'll come in a plastic bag. So one plastic bag per orange. Um, so we have to rethink the way we buy food, use food, consume food, and not waste food. And so I think that's really important. And so cities help us to keep our pe our populations together. Um, there was another question. I think I've I think you, you've, you've answered all of them, Dadenox. Yeah, but thanks. I'm going to ask you to answer this last one. I know it's two o'clock in the morning for you. Uh, yes. this, this, this very last one, what traditional South African practices or philosophies promote environmental stewardship and biodiversity cons conservation? If you could quickly answer that one, then we can release you to go to bed. <laughs> it's fine. Um, in traditional African philosophy, traditional African religion, we've got sacred spaces. We've got spaces, for example, many of them, so they've been regarded as sacred. This is the home of the ancestors, or this is a place where the gods, so I'm thinking of a mountain, which I, I don't, no longer remember the name, in, in Limpopo province, close to... Modimulle. Modimulle, thank you. Okay, this is a kind of ecologically sensitive area. It was previously, it was only allowed or it was only permitted for certain people to go there, people who are involved in traditional healing or people who have a particular relationship with the religious, um, that religious world. And yet it's now becoming a tourist spot. Everybody wants to climb Mudimulle because it's been out of, out of reach for, for generations. Uh, so I think our African traditions have set aside various places where they could be they could be ecologically fragile and kind of the traditional wisdom we haven't we mustn't lose traditional wisdom and say that these you know people have lived there or lived in those areas and have decided to set them aside for a particular purpose. Let me leave it at that. Great, thank you so much, Ndadenox, and. Uh... Thank you to everybody who attended from different parts of the globe. Uh, so this was our fourth and penultimatum uh, webinar of the season of creation 2024. Our last one will be next Tuesday with uh, Father Grant Tangay, the director of Chichichi Institute, and it will be the spirituality of uh, Laurato C. So we hope to see you again next week. Thank you again, uh, Dr. Knox, for, join, for, for presenting this uh, biodiversity loss uh, uh, presentation, uh, this webinar. We really appreciate your <clears throat> sacrifice. And uh, as we say, uh, good morning to you, uh, good night, and good night to everybody else. Uh, thank you, and uh, have a blessed evening and uh, a blessed day to you, Dr. Knox. Many thanks. Thank you very Bye. much. Well, thank God bless.